Danny, this is not something we should be concerned about. Not in any real or meaningful sense. This is something completely foreign to us. You're probably wondering why my wife of 12 years just told me this. 30 minutes ago, I left my office building, where I work as an accountant for a mid-sized accounting firm, to walk a couple of blocks to the diner where I eat lunch a couple times a week. A new eight-story office building was being built across the street from my office. There was a food truck there with a long line of construction workers waiting to order. After seeing the long line, I figured the food must be good, so I decided to get something from the food truck instead of the snack bar. This one impulsive decision led to a dramatic change in my life's path. I grabbed a beef burrito from the food truck and again made the rash and unwise decision of asking for it to be spicy. Obviously, my food constitution at 5'8 and 150 pounds was not built for the same eating habits as construction workers. Long story short, after a few minutes the burrito started to feel like a hot tornado in my stomach and I had to rush home to use the private restroom, knowing that I had a long, painful and unpleasant ordeal ahead of me. This was my second mistake of the day, but there were several more mistakes to come on this day from hell. After parking the car haphazardly on the street, I walked around the unfamiliar car in my driveway and hurried up the stairs to use the bathroom adjacent to our bedroom. Having run to the middle of the bedroom, I stopped abruptly when I saw my wife having sex with a large man. It was quite ironic when she told me, this is something completely foreign to us. With my mouth open, I continued to stare at them blankly. The shock temporarily kept my intestines from exploding. The shock must have started to wear off because my guts started screaming at me again. I ran to the bathroom, slammed the door behind me, and barely made it to the toilet before all hell broke loose. For the first few minutes, I had to focus on the urgent biological struggle between my intestines and the toilet. It gave me a much-needed break from what I had just seen. Unfortunately, the respite was short-lived. Fifteen minutes later, having gathered my strength, I opened the bathroom door to deal with my unfaithful wife. I hoped the big man had left so I could deal with her without his interference. No luck. He was still there. He stood on the left side of the bed, pulling on his shirt. Apparently my presence in the next room was not a sufficient barrier to prevent them from continuing and completing what I had so unceremoniously interrupted. Shelley looked at him with adoration and laughed. Tom, you are so bad. Looking at me, Shelley changed her tone to a more serious one. Tom, I need to talk to Danny. I'll call you later, okay, baby? Tom tilted his head slightly towards her, smiled and nodded generously. Then he turned back to me, with that same smirk on his face that seemed reserved just for me. His facial expression and posture seemed to challenge me to voice an objection or engage in physical combat with him. He was at least six, seven inches tall and sixty, seventy pounds more muscle than me. We both knew who would come out the loser of this fight. I'm ashamed to admit, but I was the first to look away. He laughed at that, finished getting dressed, and walked towards the bedroom door. He deliberately bumped me with his shoulder, pushing me back slightly. Before leaving the bedroom, he turned, Baby, why don't you pack up your things and move in with me like we always talked about? Tom, please go away. I promise we'll talk later, okay? Good, good. I'll wait for your call, baby. If you have any problems with this little man, let me know and I'll be right back. Don't forget about Saturday, but now that he knows, just spend the whole weekend with me. Shelley looked straight into my eyes as she answered him. Tom, we will definitely meet at some point. I'm not sure about a whole weekend together, but I'll let you know. But you don't have to worry about Danny. He's as soft as a kitten and as loyal and loving as a well-trained puppy. Tom laughed. You've told me so many times how small he is. Shelley laughed but for the first time I saw her blush. Tom, dear, please, you are not helping. Please leave now and let me talk to my husband and explain to him how things stand now. Please go away, okay? Good, good. With these words, Tom turned around and finally left. Not only did my wife cheat on me, but she showed no remorse, no shame, no apology, 
and she planned her next meeting with her lover right before my eyes. Hell of a sight for my husband. My only hope was that my stomach upset was causing me to hallucinate, and that the whole farce was a figment of my imagination. Interestingly, after her lover left, Shelley decided that it was finally time to cover up and put on a robe. She and I were looking at each other carefully when I heard the front door close, hoping that Tom had left. Neither of us said a word. Me, because my brain was still not processing the scene I had entered. Knowing her, she was waiting for me to break down again and you'll obey her. Over the years I have always deferred to Shelley. She always got her way. I was always too weak when it came to her. After several minutes of silent resistance, I was again the first to give in. How long has this been going on? She chuckled lightly and said disdainfully, How long it takes doesn't matter, dear. You're asking the wrong question. Oh, and what's the right question? The right question is, am I leaving you? How does this affect us? Do I love him? Have I stopped loving you? It looks like you'll be asking the right questions and giving all the answers, Shelley. Okay, I'll play. Are you leaving me? No, honey. I'm not going to leave you if you play your cards right and don't overreact to it. What you saw has nothing to do with us. It's something I need in addition to us, not instead of us. The practical manner in which Shelley said it, and the fact that it was practically a repeat of the first thing she had said when I caught them, made it clear to me that this was a well-prepared and rehearsed speech. Perhaps she foresaw that one day she would be caught or was planning to lay all this out to me in advance. He said you were planning to move in together. How are you going to move in with him without leaving me? Shelley waved her hand. Danny, forget about it. He talks about us moving in together all the time, not me. He is my main man when it comes to sex, but you are my main man in everything else. So forget everything he said. I'm not leaving you, and he and I are not going to move in together. I need both of you, not one instead of the other, okay? Shelley finished with a sigh, as if annoyed at having to explain this to two stubborn and stupid children. Okay, you don't plan on leaving me. Does this mean you are leaving him? Shelley shook her head, frowning. Darling, you're not listening. I just told you that this has nothing to do with us, that I need it. You heard me promise Tom that we would meet this weekend. Just because I don't want to move in with him doesn't mean I don't want him. What made you think I was going to break up with him? This food truck was supposed to be a portal to a parallel universe. This cannot be the same woman I knew for almost 20 years and was married to for 12. Has she always been this crazy? I remember you made certain promises to me too, my dear. For example, little things like give up all others. Do you remember them? Because if you don't, we have a recording on CD that I can play for you. Stop being stupid, Danny. I'm not leaving you, and I'm not breaking up with Tom. The sooner you accept this, the better it will be for everyone. So then, the problem was in me that I did not want to share my wife. We weren't getting anywhere. Shelley again, how long has this been taking, and more importantly, why? Honey, I already told you that how long it takes doesn't matter. How will this knowledge help you accept it and understand it all? And I already told you why. Shelley, who said I was accepting this and trying to figure this shit out. And no, you didn't explain why the hell. First of all, don't you dare raise your voice at me, Danny. I try to explain everything to you patiently. So don't you dare be cocky with me, baby. Can you hear me? And yes, I told you why. I just didn't go into detail to spare your little feelings and your male ego. I told you this is something I need. Look, Danny. You're a pretty boring guy. There are many great things about you, but being good in bed is not one of them. In the end, you never gave me pleasure in this regard. He makes me feel like a woman when I'm with him. Then why the hell are you still here? Why don't you just pack your things and go see him? Danny, calm down. This will get you nowhere. I'm not going to deal with you until you stop your whims. You need to stop feeling sorry for yourself and get used to it, kid. You have to understand that nothing has changed between us. I've been dating Tom for almost two years. You never knew about it, and it didn't affect us in any way. Now that everything's out in the open, I'll probably see him a little more, 
but only a little more often and maybe on the weekends now and then. We've been wanting to do this for a long time, but to spare your feelings, we kept everything a secret. No more. Shelley ended her tirade with a huff, as if remembering all the times my existence had interfered with their desire for each other. She softened her tone and changed her tactics. But honey, this will just give you more time for your own hobbies. You will see that this is good for us. It won't hurt us unless you do it yourself. This was the first time I saw Shelley in a completely different light since I first saw her in seventh grade. All these years I've been creating a story in my head about who she is, but I began to see that this story was an illusion that was significantly different from reality. In a calm voice I asked, Shelly, if I'm so boring and useless in bed, why are you still with me instead of leaving for him? It sounds like if you are single, he wants a relationship and commitment with you. Why are you still here? Honey, listen, there are areas in which Tom excels. For example, in fun and sex. There are areas in which you excel. You are very loving. You always put me first. You're a great provider. You have a good job that my friends envy and wish their husbands were like you. You have your strengths, and Tom has his. I want both of you. I don't want him instead of you, and I don't want you instead of him, okay? I want you both. Why is this so difficult for you to understand? What is he doing? Shelley muttered something quickly. I asked her to repeat it. He's a courier. Yeah, now I'm starting to see the whole picture. She smiled placed her hands on her hips, tilted her left hip slightly, and tilted her head to the side, as if I finally understood everything. God, who is this woman? I went to the dressing room and took my suitcase. I laid him on the bed and started packing my things. What do you think you're doing, Danny? What does it look like? You don't want to leave, so I'm leaving. You're crazy if you think I'll put up with you spending my money and then going to bed with him. Are you completely crazy, or have you always been this stupid? I'm leaving and going to a lawyer to get the hell out of you. You're not going anywhere, Danny, and no one is going to get divorced. If you try to get a divorce, I'll take everything you have and leave you penniless, baby, and you will pay me child support for the rest of your life. God, why are the stupid and uneducated the most confident in what they think they know? Shelley, you're forgetting that I'm a CPA. Over the years, I have had many clients go through divorce and understand how it affected their financial situation. You work part-time, so I'll have to pay. You've got alimony for a couple years or so, but the judge will tell your lazy ass to get a full-time job. And yes, we will share what we have, but it's not much. But after that you'll be left with the crap money you make. So don't threaten something you know nothing about. Go to hell. I finished packing my things and left the house. I rented a room for a long stay. I was angry and an emotional mess. The next day I called the doctor. My stomach got better, but my soul was now very sick. Luckily, it was Friday, with the weekend ahead. Another lucky thing was that it was October. Tax extension season is now over, which was the slowest time of the year for me. By December we will begin preparing for the new tax season with the first four months of the year being my busiest. I found a small bar near the motel where I was staying. I felt very sorry for myself. The more I drank, the more I imagined Shelley and her lover. I didn't need a wild imagination to do this. It was pretty close to the reality I witnessed. I felt like a complete failure with nothing to offer the world, especially to a woman. Shelley told me I was useless in bed. But for me, and I think for any guy, it was a useless period. My bartender was a guy named Pat. He was a short man, maybe an inch or two shorter than my 5FT8 in frame. At first, he patiently listened to my story of woe, which was very helpful. However, he ceased to be useful when he turned from a listener to an advisor. He said guys like us need to accept our situation. We didn't have that much interest. We needed to accept our flaws and accept the life of a cuckold. That I'll never find a woman like Shelley again. And even if I was lucky and found someone as good as her, she would still do the same to me. So I might as well save myself a lot of grief and crawl back to Shelley, ask for her forgiveness, and hope she'll take me back. He told me his story. Apparently he had a degree in psychology, 
but chose to work as a bartender instead. He said he prefers to use what he learned in his psychology classes with his patrons every day. He told me that the same thing happened to him. His wife cheated on him, but he was not as lucky as me. One day he came home and his wife told him that she was divorcing him in order to marry her lover and for him to leave home. So I was lucky that my wife still wanted me. That I was an ungrateful bastard for looking a gift horse in the mouth. That I was looking at all this wrong. I take great pleasure in the psychological and emotional pain my wife caused me. That I have to crawl back and beg her to take me back. Pat helped me a lot. True, not quite as he expected. I went from self-pity to anger. This guy was pathetic. He had experienced significant trauma in his life, and he decided to accept it and incorporate it into his lifestyle. A strange psychological phenomenon of compensation and an attempt to come to terms with a serious phobia and take control of it. Instead of having the courage to fight this fear, he wanted me to completely master it and incorporate it into my life. I didn't want to be like that. This is not the future I wanted for myself. If my only choice was between living alone and living as a cuckold, I would choose living alone, where at least I could hold my head up high and look at myself. Mirror without inducing vomiting. I had a lot to think about, and the answer couldn't come from a bottle, and certainly not from Pat. I realized that the answers had to come from within me. I had to first figure out how I got here, and then figure out what kind of future I wanted and how I could get there. The first time I saw Shelley was in the second period of the first day of seventh grade, and it was passion at first sight. Unlike my shy introvert, she was a cheerful extrovert. She was also very beautiful. I was too shy to pursue Shelley, but we lived on the same street. We often walked home from school along the same road. We never hung out together and occasionally spoke more than a few words in class. One day, in the middle of the eighth grade, we had a situation, and I helped her a lot. I won't go into details. A couple of evenings after the incident, there was a knock on the door of the apartment that my mother and I shared. I opened the door and saw Shelley standing with a woman and a man, who turned out to be her parents, behind her. In short, they came to thank me for what I had done. Her mother hugged me tightly and a tear ran down her cheek. My father shook my hand, telling me what a worthy young man I was, and then he too hugged me tightly, completely enveloping me in his large figure. From then on, Shelley and I went to and from school together. Even though she lived further from school, I came to her house every morning and we walked together. And after school I walked her all the way to the door. But as soon as we came to school, we went different ways and socialized in different companies. Shelley was among the popular ones, and I was among the nerds. I wasn't particularly awkward or strange-looking. I was just more interested in intellectual things. I was raised by a single mother who struggled every day to provide for us. It was very important to her that I achieve something in life, so that I don't find myself in the same struggle for existence as she is. So I took my studies and getting good grades very seriously. Besides, I was not an athlete. Shelley loved athletes. Throughout the rest of middle school and high school, I watched Shelley date one athlete after another. I should have realized then that I was not her type. We sometimes talked after school. However, I was the one she complained to about the athletes she dated. That they are all selfish and that they are only interested in themselves and sports. What if they were more sensitive like me and listened to her like I did? How she wishes they were more like me. But when I asked the obvious, why wouldn't she date me, she simply smiled and moved the conversation to another topic. I scored in the 97th percentile on the SAT math test and in the 86th percentile on the language section. I was accepted into every university I applied to, but I ended up going to a local state university. This way I could continue to live at home and save. Thanks to scholarships, financial aid, and student loans, I was able to pay for everything myself without burdening my mother since my father abandoned us when I was three, and my part-time job gave me pocket money. Without Shelley to pine for and wait for, I dated a few girls in college and had one long-term relationship that lasted ten months. I decided to stay at the same university to pursue my MBA. 
It was the second ranked MBA program in the state, so I didn't miss out on much by not going to another university. In my second and final year of the MBA program, Shelly showed up at my door again, but this time alone. I invited her inside and we talked for a few minutes, reminiscing about our past and discussing what we had done since high school. She followed me through mutual friends and knew that I was studying at this university and in the MBA program. We made a date for that Friday and that led to subsequent dates. Seven months later we got engaged and six months later we got married. I took a job at a mid-sized accounting firm with the idea that I would stay there for two or three years and then start my own firm. But Shelley was always against this. She said that I earn good money, why take risks? To open my own practice, I must not only be good with numbers, but also be able to sell and communicate with people. That I don't have it. So I listened to her and stayed at the same job. I made about $150,000 a year, but mostly made the firm richer. This was an area that I also wanted to change. Having finished thinking about how I got to where I was, I needed to think about what I wanted for my future. I was going to dedicate this year to completely changing my life path. I was going to realize my dream of starting my own company, and Shelly was going to help fund the start. I was going to use our startup savings and have Shelly work full-time to pay most, if not all, of the household expenses. She had used me financially in the past, now I was going to use her to finance my future. The second area I wanted to focus on was improving my physical condition, both for my self-image and to increase my chances of attracting a good partner. I will never get taller, but I can make the most of what I have. I was going to get in better shape and gain muscle mass. Third, I was going to work on my romantic future. It's one thing to intellectually accept that what I have to offer isn't that bad, but it's another to overcome the emotional and psychological pain these two have inflicted on my psyche. I was going to approach this the same way I would approach any other goal I pursued. At first I was going to study the topic, read all kinds of books about sex, and then I was going to get some hands-on training by dating a few women. I'll start at the bottom, meeting the low-hanging fruit, the fours and fives, and work my way up. And lastly, I needed to satisfy my thirst for revenge. These two deliberately set out to harm me. When they were caught, instead of repenting and apologizing, they went on the offensive, attacking me. They made fun of my height and physique, which was genetic and something I couldn't change. And then they attacked my sexual identity as a man. I wasn't going to go to jail and risk my future for revenge but I wasn't going to let them get away with it. My revenge plans for Shelley were to give her hope of reconciliation and to get her to finance my future. I was also going to find a way to drive a wedge between them and separate them. When I'm ready to move on, I'll pull the rug out from under her and leave her penniless and alone. At that point, the best thing I could think of to do to him was to make him feel small and pathetic, like he tried to do to me. We all have our vulnerabilities, and I thought I had found him. His vulnerabilities were lack of intelligence, education, and income. Plus, he seemed to want commitment and a relationship with Shelley, but she only wanted sex. I was sure that she was not the first woman with whom he wanted a long-term relationship, but who only saw him as a fuck buddy. We are all jealous of what we cannot have. I knew guys like Tom. To get noticed, they went to the gym not to get fit, but to get pumped up and be noticed because they were never taken seriously. I was taken seriously from childhood because I was usually one of the smartest kids in the class and later one of the smartest people in almost any room. I was going to belittle Tom and hit him where it would hurt the most. The first thing I had to do was lose my job. When several weeks spent on sick leave or showing up at work half drunk didn't do the trick, I went into the boss's office and started yelling at him that he was running the company badly, that he had ugly children, and that his wife was a debauchee. It worked. You might think it was a terrible thing on my part, but I felt vindicated because everything I told him was true. One sunny Saturday afternoon in November in Southern California, I walked into my house with a suitcase in hand. The noise I made must have caught their attention because Shelly and Tom ran from the kitchen into the living room to see me come in and set my suitcase down in the hallway. Shelly's face, initially worried, 
turned into a sly smile when she saw me. Tom, however, frowned. Honey, I'm back, I said to Shelley in an exaggerated tone. Tom didn't look happy to see me. What makes you think you can just come back here? You don't live here anymore. I live here. You abandoned her and left her alone. Now she is with me and only with me. There's no place for you here. So take your things and get the hell out. Well, they say the gods laugh when people plan. Goodbye to my annual plan. Shelley turned to Tom. Tom, dear, shut up. This is still Danny's house. Then she turned to me. So you finally stopped making a scene and are ready to crawl back, huh? I smiled. Yes, madam. I am going back home. So I think you need to get Tommy's things and get him out of here. Tom started to move towards me, but Shelley put her arm around his waist and held him back. Danny, Tom lives here now and he's not going anywhere. It's all your fault. If you hadn't abandoned me and didn't answer my calls and messages, I would have given you more time to deal with this and accept the situation. But no, you had to play the martyr. Tom lives here now and he's in the master bedroom. So you'll have to stay in the guest room. This is the new reality. Got it, Danny. This will be much more difficult than I thought. Can I stand it? I thought I'd just go home and use Shelley for my continued success while finding a way to get back at these two. But can I live under the same roof with this idiot and see their infidelity every day? Tom interrupted my thoughts. Shelley, we don't need him. You're working full time now, and with my salary we'll be fine. Tell him to go back to where he came from. Tom, dear, wait. This can work to everyone's benefit. Danny is like that bad son from the Bible who realized his mistakes and came home ready to admit that he was wrong and that now he will be good and obedient. His departure changed everything. You are now the man of the house, dear, and especially you are my main man when it comes to the bedroom, and don't forget that. We must rise above this and take it back, although he doesn't deserve it. Wow, I thought. I was the prodigal son. I needed to be accepted back into my own home, which I was paying for. Tom clearly didn't like me coming back, which made me want to stay to annoy him. Besides, my presence here will clearly strain their relationship. If I left now, there would be no return, and all my plans for the future would disappear. So I decided to stay. Later, I will decide whether to abandon the plan and start over. Okay, I understand. I'll move my things to the guest room. I have the rest of my things in the car. Shelley smiled at my surrender. Tom gave me a dirty look. Well, you can't please everyone. Tom had a strange work schedule. He worked three or four shifts from four in the evening to midnight and two regular shifts from nine to five. I usually left the house by eight in the morning, went to coffee shops or the library to work on a business plan. Although I had no intention of working for anyone else, I applied for unemployment benefits, so I sent a resume to potential employers to satisfy the requirements of the employment office, so they continued to send me $1.200 monthly. Basically, I tried to be at home as little as possible when that idiot was there. On Wednesday of the second week, Tom worked the night shift, so I was home early. Shelley came into the kitchen and interrupted my dinner. She smiled tightly. Danny, dear, when you're done, come to the living room. We need to talk. Thinking she was ready to end our strained new arrangement, I slowly finished my sandwich, grabbed a beer, and walked into the living room. Okay, Shelley, what did you want to talk about? Actually, we need to discuss a few things. First of all, I know this new situation is difficult for you. But I want to say that you're doing really well, considering the circumstances. Believe it or not, you're better at this than Tom. It's difficult for him, but I'm working on it. She smiled widely. After this confrontation with Shelley, a kind of truce was established between us. Basically, we treated each other like roommates. My goal was to destroy the self-esteem of both enemies, just as they tried to do with mine. This was the best way to get back at Shelley by reminding her of her shortcomings and shattering her illusions about herself. With Tom, I had to fight an asymmetrical war. No matter how much I train, I will never get six inches taller 
or be as wide and strong as him. But I knew guys like Tom. His weakness was his lack of intelligence and education. I needed to approach this with an open heart and be fair to women. It's not their fault that I chose a bitch as my wife. They won't have to pay for Shelley's sins. I forced myself to be more open and vulnerable. It was scary to be so vulnerable with a woman again. But a little over a year later, after filing for divorce and dating a few times, I met Amy. One evening, while the three of us were having dinner together, Shelley again did most of the talking with me, which clearly annoyed Tom. At one point she asked me if I had any new job offers. Yesterday I had my second interview at a company in the city center. They practically made it clear that the job was mine if I wanted it. I asked about the salary, and they said $120,000. I probably looked unimpressed because they said it would be a base salary and that there would be bonuses. I thanked them and said I would think about it. I was making $150,000 a year. I'm not going back to $120,000. And frankly, I think I was undervalued by $150,000. I need at least 150000 base salary with a good bonus structure to even consider this offer. All this time I was looking at Shelley. However, my real target was Tom, whom I saw out of the corner of my eye. He was seething with anger. He probably made 30 35 k a year at most. I'm sure it infuriated him that I so calmly rejected the $120,000 offer. But that was my goal. I didn't go to interviews, so I didn't have the opportunity to decline offers. I just wanted to piss him off. But luck often comes from unexpected places. This time it came from Shelley. Honey, are you sure you don't want to consider the offer for 120000 It's a good base salary, and they said there will be bonuses. Besides, they will quickly see that you are worth much more than 120000 and will promote you. Tom and I together make a little over half of that base salary, honey. Danny, I haven't bought new dresses or shoes in months, and we haven't gone to a decent restaurant in months. You need to find a good job and start taking me with you again, honey. Tom looked like he was ready to explode. Inside I was celebrating, but outside I was calm and thoughtful. Why don't you buy new shoes and dresses, Shelley? And why doesn't Tom take you to good places? Shelley laughed heartily. Danny, I don't want to go to McDonald's. I want to go to nice places like we used to go to. Tom leaned back in his chair and stood up abruptly, dropping the chair to the floor. Shelley finally realized her tactlessness and took Tom's right hand with her left. Tom, honey, forgive me. I didn't mean to say it the way it sounded. When I laughed out loud, they both looked at me and I grinned back at them. Point. Tom pulled his right hand out of her left and rushed towards me, but Shelley grabbed his left hand with her right and began to pull him towards the living room. Tom, honey, let's go upstairs. Danny's just jealous because he can't sleep with me anymore. He just wants to cause trouble, honey. Let's go upstairs. When they left, she looked at me with a sneer on her face. This made her turn away abruptly. I called after them. Oh, guys, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean anything bad. Look, to make it up to me, I'm sure I saw a coupon for McDonald's somewhere. I'll find it for you, okay? And he laughed out loud. Tom tried to pull away from Shelly, but this time she grabbed his shoulder with both hands. Come on, honey. Don't mind him. My mother was one of the wisest people I knew, and I respected her greatly. She had no opportunity for an education. She raised me by working low-paying office jobs during the day and as a waitress several evenings a week to support the two of us. I never judged Shelley for her lack of education or her job. I never thought about it. If I had met Tom under different circumstances, I wouldn't have thought about his work either. I would judge him by his character. But it was a war. I had to exploit any vulnerability I sensed in them. A few weeks later, Shelley surprised me again. Tom was at work and Shelley and I were having dinner together. As I stood up to take the plate to the sink, Shelley asked, Honey, can we talk? I have an idea that I think you'll like. I answered cautiously, Okay. Honey, I think we've been approaching this all wrong all along. It's mostly my fault. I should have communicated better with you. 
Her first thought was that she must have stumbled upon some article about pop culture psychology or a TV show. The second thought was that it was incredible that she thought our problems were due to the fact that she did not communicate with me enough, but I nodded for her to continue. I thought it would be interesting. Darling, I started out saying that it had nothing to do with us, that it was separate from us. I think that was completely the wrong approach. I should have included you in it, make you a part of it. When I raised an eyebrow at her, she continued, Just listen to me, honey. I think you'll like where I'm going. Let me lay it all out before you say anything, and be open and non-judgmental. Please. I nodded for her to continue. Okay, I understand how in the beginning you felt like I was going to devote all my time to Tom. I mean, it turned out that way because you did it that way, but from the very beginning I should have approached it in a different way. You just surprised me the day you walked in on us, darling. When I'm with him, all these crazy thoughts must be running through your head about how good he is and how you can't and that must make you feel inadequate. I wondered what made her think I would enjoy this conversation. I talked to Tom about all this, and we came up with a great idea, honey. I think you'll like it. Shelley said the last thing with a big proud smile on her face, as if she finally understood the meaning of life. So, honey, we thought it would be great if you could join us sometimes. Not always, of course. Most of the time we like to do this in private, but sometimes. Even before you walked in on us, I had this fantasy, and lately it's pretty much all I think about. When the expression on my face must have changed, she added, I mean in general, he's tall and big and strong. That's another one of the things I like so much about him. It's not your fault that you don't like that, but that's what I need, dear, to feel small next to my man. Anyway, you promise to be open-minded and listen to me with an open mind, and then tell me your opinion, okay? I didn't remember promising her anything like that, but since this conversation was mostly hers, Maybe her imaginary self made that promise to her. And then she started saying crazy things. Won't it be incredibly hot, honey? It'll be like we're all sharing the same experience. We're each playing our part. Shelley paused and looked a little nervous, waiting for my reaction. When she was silent for a few minutes, I decided it was my turn to speak. Honey, that really does sound incredibly hot. I think one of the reasons our sex life has gone downhill is because we haven't shared our fantasies enough. When Shelly looked like she was about to object, I raised my hand. Honey, I'm not saying that's necessarily the number one reason, just one of the reasons. Now I realize that I obviously don't have what you need. Anyway, I think the idea of including me from time to time is extremely generous of you. I think that's great. Sure, it might blow up in our faces, but we have nothing left to lose, right? If we still have a chance to save this marriage, your idea of us all sharing everything and being completely open with each other makes sense. I'm very glad that you and Tom talked and generously decided to include me in your list. Company. I smiled at Shelley, and she gave me a big smile in return. But I thought you were talking about madness. No, no, and no again. Stupid, stupid bitch, I muttered under my breath. Two nights later, Shelley was recounting our conversation about fantasies to her best friend Doris at the same bar I went to when my world first fell apart. The bartender turned out to be Pat again. While he was wiping glasses, he listened to the women's conversation. He pretended that his attention was directed elsewhere, but in fact he was listening carefully to their conversation. When Shelley finished her story, Pat shook his head disapprovingly, condemning the guy who was too stupid to appreciate his happiness. Doris laughed, almost hysterically, when Shelley finished. So, he literally told you to eat shit and die. Doris, this isn't funny. It's my marriage and my life we're talking about. I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh, but I can't help it. Look, when you first told me about all this, and how you wanted Danny to accept Tom, and how you were going to get Danny to do it, I thought that this whole thing is hot. I thought you were crazy and that it was too risky, but I thought it was hot, okay? I mean, what woman wouldn't want to have her cake and eat it too? But honey, you have to admit when you're wrong. It's obvious that Danny will never accept this threesome thing. You'll have to choose one or the other. 
If you still have a chance with your husband, then honestly, I'm not sure that you still have him. But one thing is clear. You will have to make a choice and make it soon, otherwise you will simply lose them both. No, Doris, I can't do this. I need them both. I need Tom for sex. But now that he's moved and I see him all the time, I just want him to shut up. It's unbearable sometimes. On the other hand, Danny is practically useless in bed, but I need his love. And he's really smart. He can talk about anything. I always learn something new from him. He'll get a good job again, and I'll go back to that lifestyle I should lead. But this time everything will be better, because I will have both my men, and I will have the best of both worlds, and everything will be open. Danny's just still angry. He's stubborn as a mule. This is so unlike him. He should have given up by now. But I need both. I can't give up on either of them. Danny needs to understand that. He'll definitely get there. Doris realized that her friend was living in a fantasy world, but it was also obvious that trying to force her to see reality would be a waste of time and effort. Of course, honey. I'm sure he'll come. Shelley smiled at Doris's assurances. That's why Doris was her best friend. She understood her and always supported her. It's been a couple more months since Shelley and I shared our fantasies. All those articles in men's and women's magazines about how sharing fantasies brings couples closer turned out to be wrong in our case. Shelley and I basically just coexisted in the same house, each in our own separate bedroom. We became neighbors out of financial necessity, not out of love and intimacy. She had been much more tense the last few days, although she said she had great sex. She had to balance which bills to pay and which to defer due to their meager salary. This has always been my area of concern and stress. She could no longer flutter like a careless butterfly, oblivious to the real world. For my part, I was receiving about $1.00 a month from unemployment insurance, which they both didn't know about. It was good for the first six months of unemployment, and it was about to end. This was enough to pay for weekly visits and cover my basic needs. The savings and home loan I received were used to set up an office and purchase furniture and supplies. The money Shelley threatened to take from me financed my future. I contacted most of the clients from my old firm, and many decided to come with me. I was busy doing taxes and doing their bookkeeping. I urgently needed to hire an assistant. I did not bill them for services rendered. I didn't want to show any profit yet. I had already started to implement my plan to go to the gym, and although at first I dated girls that I rated as four, I now dated mostly seven. It's not good to count women by numbers, but my mind works with numbers, so judge for yourself. On Friday night, I had a date with Simone. She was a 32-year-old divorced woman I met on a dating site. She was 5'4", blonde, with a sweet face. It was our fourth date, we were having dinner and dancing, and I decided to bring her to my house. It was the first time I had brought another woman home. I haven't brought women home before. At first it was because I didn't want to bring home girls I rated as fours and fives. I thought it wouldn't impress any of my roommates and would probably backfire on me. And secondly, I really didn't want the headache that I knew bringing another woman home would bring. But I felt that Simone would stay for a while and Shelley would definitely see her as competition. Simone smiled and said, someone's having a good time. I told her they were my roommates and hoped she would get some ideas. She gave me a lustful smile and said that yes, she definitely did. She grabbed my hand and told me to go to the bedroom. The next morning, completely satisfied, Simone and I went down to the kitchen for coffee and a hearty breakfast. Shelley and Tom were already there, having breakfast. Fortunately, they were both in dressing gowns and not naked or semi-naked, as sometimes happened. Shelley was shocked to see Simone. Tom smiled at her, looking her up and down. It was time for introductions. Simone, this is my soon-to-be ex-wife Shelley and that idiot with a grin looking back at you is Tom. That line wiped the grin off Tom's face, but it came back when Shelley said, Danny, how sweet, you found yourself a little playmate. How much are you paying her for it? Simone was clearly uncomfortable, so I decided not to continue. 
I've already talked about my family situation so she doesn't walk into a minefield unprepared. But there was no point in dragging her into my storm. Shelley felt no need to be hospitable or chivalrous to my guest. With venom in her voice, Shelley raged, You know he's a married man, right? I put my arm around someone's waist and smiled at her. Not for long, Simone. You won't get divorced, little man. It won't happen, so put it out of your mind. Got it? Apparently, a peaceful post-sex breakfast on Saturday was not in our plans. It didn't really fit into my schedule. I had enough money and the business was starting to do well to support itself and pay me a small salary, but I still wanted them to support me for a few more months. More importantly, I have not yet destroyed their relationship and achieved my revenge. However, I couldn't turn the other cheek. Plus, with Shelley emotionally unstable, I wanted to see if I could score another point at Tom's expense. Shelley, what's wrong with you? Tom has made it clear that he wants to marry you. We're done with you. Why don't you divorce me and ride off into the sunset with the man of your dreams? Because I've already told you a thousand times that I don't want him in that way. He's only good for sex, that's all. You're my husband. You're the one I love, and you're the only one I want to be married to and you are the one I will stay married to. Why can't you finally understand this? Tom's grin disappeared completely. He was angry. Once again, I hit the bull's eye of his soft, vulnerable underbelly. He was uneducated and had a mediocre mind at best. The market did not value its economic value highly. Deep down, people saw him as worthless, and he knew it. We all want the women in our lives to value us above all others. Ever since I caught Tom with Shelley, I needed her to validate my worth as a sexual being. But she didn't. Tom needed Shelley to appreciate him in all other aspects. But she didn't. With a smirk on my face, I turned to Tom. What's it like to be just a guy for sex and nothing more? Seeing the look on Tom's face, I realized that I had probably gone too far this time. Tom, already fuming in his chair, jumped up at my comment. I retreated impulsively, pulling Simone with me. Tom and I looked at each other. I had no chance in a physical confrontation with him. But instead of going straight at me, Tom chose a different tactic. He looked away from me to Simone and gave her a worried smile. To Simone, that's what they talk about, baby. Why don't you and I go upstairs so I can show you what a real man can do? With these words, he grabbed Simone's hand and pulled her out of my arms, starting to pull her towards the stairs. Simone tried to break free, but still walked forward, stumbling as he pulled her by the hand. She protested and asked to be released. This made him pull her even harder. There was a fight between us. The next time I opened my eyes, I found myself in an unfamiliar room, lying on a bed. Looking around, I realized that I must be in a hospital room. Simone sat in the chair to the left, looking at her phone. I asked worriedly, Simone, are you okay? Simone's head shot up and a wide smile shone on her sweet face. She stood up and took my hand. Hi, honey, I am fine. How are you feeling, darling? I feel like I've been put through a meat grinder. What happened? Please tell me that you ran away that he didn't do anything to you. Nothing happened to me, honey. Shelly stopped him. Shelly went crazy. She screamed hysterically at him. You were unconscious too, honey. The ambulances arrived and took you both to the hospital. We were both here next to you. Shelly is now in the hallway talking to the detective. What a nightmare. Simone's face smiled with concern. You can say that. Will all my dates with you end in such drama? This made me laugh, which hurt my left side. No, only every fourth date. A few minutes later, Shelley came in. She and Simone exchanged glances. Simone let go of my hand and said that she would go get some coffee and be back soon. After Simone left, Shelley took her place, standing to my left. She hesitantly reached out to take my hand. I started to pull my hand away, but then I stopped and let her take it. Danny, I'm so sorry. I never thought something like this would happen. Really, Shelley, you thought you could live with your lover and husband under the same roof and didn't expect things to go wrong? 
How many times have you stopped him from attacking me in the last six months? Shelley looked away, conveniently avoiding my question, and then looked back at me. Danny, when you were lying on the ground holding his leg, everything came back to me. You did the same for me. You saved my life. And now you were doing it for another woman. What the hell did I do, Danny? How could I ruin everything so badly? How could I do all the nasty things I've done to you these past few months? You saved my life and did everything to make me happy, but how can I thank you? By cheating on you and throwing it in your face, trying to force it on you. What's wrong with me? I was silent for a long time. What can we say? For the first time, her conscience spoke to her brain. But when she continued to look at me as if I had all the answers, I finally spoke my mind. You're finally starting to realize what you've done, Shelley. There's nothing new I can tell you that I haven't been saying for the past few months. The problem is, Shelley, you never respected me. You respected athletes, big guys. They were men. I was just a wimp. In your eyes, I never deserve your respect as a man. That's why you could do all these nasty things. You would never have done what you have done to me over the past few months if you respected me as a man. How can you say I never respected you, Danny? You saved my life, for God's sake. You risked your life for a girl you barely knew. You are the smartest person I know. You're a great provider. I will always love you. Dear Danny, always. I just forgot, that's all, and everything will change. No, you didn't, Shelley. To you, I was still a skinny, short guy. A wimp. Your father is a big guy, and in your head the image of a man is a big, tall guy. I didn't fit that image. You saw what I did that day as an accident. Did you see me as someone worthy of dating after that? No, you still followed all the big guys. You saw me as one of your friends. Different from one of her friends. You're wrong, Danny. You have the heart of a lion. Not only did you save me, but you fought a guy much bigger than you to save Simone. Yes, and my wife had to save me again. Don't you dare say that, Danny. You shouldn't have beaten that bastard that day, and you shouldn't have beaten Tom. They're both much bigger than you. But the important thing is that at the right time, you risked your life to save us. The last thing you are, Danny, is a wimp. The problem is, Shelley, maybe you're thinking that now. Or maybe you're just saying it now but all this time you weren't thinking that way. Either way, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. What are you talking about, Danny? Look, I take some of the blame. You saw me as a friend, as less than a man, and I bought into that. I was a kid with no life experience, and the girl I wanted with my whole body told me in every possible way that she doesn't see me as a guy worthy of her. But those big jocks got you excited, you never said those exact words. Danny, I don't see you as a man, but I see these other guys as men. But everything you did screamed it loud and clear. The problem is, I believed it too. When I went to college, everything changed for me. Women treated me differently. They might not have craved me the way you craved Tom, but they still craved me. They respected me for the qualities I offered. But then my dream, which was always unattainable, one day knocked on my door. Suddenly you wanted me. And then, after we started dating and you agreed to marry me, I always let you get away with all your antics. Part of me was so grateful that you finally wanted me. It's like you finally dedicated yourself. I was too passive. I should have resisted and put you in your place a long time ago. It's one thing to deceive you, but the way you did it, and then threw it in my face and expected me to just put up with everything while you cheated. On me. This shows that you have absolutely no respect for me as a man. So I take part of the blame. You were a selfish, corrupt individual to begin with. My inability to resist and defend myself made it easier for you to continue and be completely corrupted. As they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I gave you too much power in this relationship, and I mean since seventh grade. So you ended up thinking your poop didn't smell. We all want to feel special, Shelley. We had to make each other special, and it went to your head. You didn't do anything to make me feel special, and I let you get away with it. Shelley took a couple of minutes to process what I said. You're right, Danny. You screwed up, and I screwed up. 
Now we can work together to make things right, maybe see a counselor. I shook my head and laughed. You're really something, Shelley. No, you're the one who screwed up. When I kept thinking about how my life had turned into this crap, I wanted to see if there was anything I could have done differently. If there was something I could control to not end up in the same situation again. What I should have done was be more honest with myself about the kind of person you were and never married you. And even if I did marry you, I shouldn't have let you treat me badly and get away with it like I did. So me admitting my mistakes doesn't take all the blame away from you. It's like a woman driving into a bad area late at night and getting robbed or worse. Yes, for her own good, it should be a lesson to her not to do it again. But that doesn't take the blame off the criminal. Where we are now is, it's 100% your fault, Shelley. My lesson is to never let anyone do this to me again. With a few more tears running down Shelley's face, she nodded, and we both fell silent. Shelley muttered something I couldn't understand. I didn't hear you, Shelley. What did you say? You fought for her, Danny. Why didn't you fight for me? Fight for you? Fight for you? You can't be so delusional, Shelley. What was there to fight for? What the hell did I have to fight for? I don't mean fight for me in that sense. I mean, why didn't you fight to get me back, to win me from him? God, Shelley, I honestly don't know if you're completely crazy or if I am at this point. Fight to get you back. You were my damn wife. We were supposed to be on the same team. You weren't some free agent for which two men had to fight. I shouldn't have fought for you. You're the one who cheated on me. You're the one who had to fight to get me back. What's wrong with you? Tears began to stream down Shelley's face. You're right, Danny. You're right about everything. The more you gave, the more I took, and the more I thought I deserved. And you're right. My job is to fight for you. To bring you back. And I'll get you back, Mr. Shelley said the last part with a strained hope on her tear-streaked face. No, you won't bring me back, Shelley. This ship sailed a long time ago. We both need to put this behind us, break up, and move on. I'll get you back, Danny. You have to give me another chance. Please, I can't live without you, honey. Since I walked in on her, it was truly the first time Shelley and I had had a real conversation, and I had a chance to really say it all. The problem was that all this emotion and talking was draining my modest reserves of energy. I decided to change the subject. With a slight chuckle, Simone said you gave Tommy a good whack. Shelley laughed nervously. Yeah, I guess I lost control for a moment. When he hit you, it all came over me at that moment. That's it, Danny. At that moment, everything came back. Everything came together. I was so angry with Tom. I blamed him for everything. For the way we hurt you. For the way I hurt you. For all the nasty things I did to you. Actually, it was all my fault, but I took it all on Tom. Shelley hugged herself by the shoulders. She was crying and her whole body was shaking. Simone entered the scene. Shelley looked at Simone and ran out of the room. Simone watched Shelley hurry away, then turned to me. I just shrugged. I was too emotionally and physically exhausted to explain anything at this point. Danny, I need to go. Shelly and I talked a lot while you were unconscious. Obviously, you two still have some issues to resolve, so I'm going to get out of this situation. When I started to object, Simone raised her hand to stop me. Danny, you're still living with her. You're still in limbo. It's obvious that you two still have a lot of unresolved issues and feelings for each other, at best. I'll be your comfort, and I don't need that. I can't handle this with you, Danny. I have to go. With these words, Simone hurriedly left my life. I made two women cry and leave me within minutes. Obviously, I was getting better at communicating with women. If luck is where preparation meets opportunity, then I must have been well prepared for what ended up happening. I tried to drive a wedge between Shelley and Tom, and I sought to destroy their self-esteem, exposing all their flaws and insecurities, just as they tried to do with mine. Ultimately, the morning Tom attacked Simone and me, it was because I used Shelley to crush the last vestiges of his crumbling self-esteem. But here's where I got really lucky, except for the beating. 
Three weeks later, after being hospitalized, Tom left her in handcuffs. Briefly, he was charged with aggravated assault. He received two years in prison for trying to save his self-esteem. This is where the irony lies. While Shelley cheated on me and then treated me badly, my life sucked. But for her, everything seemed fine. But when she finally did the right thing, protecting her husband from an even worse beating and saving her husband's friend, she received 90 days in prison for her efforts. Yes, Shelley also found herself accused of assaulting Tom. And they will both now have criminal records. I wonder what kind of job Tom can find in the future. After leaving the hospital, Shelley and I returned to living together in our home, each in our own bedroom. She tried several times to lure me back into the master bedroom, but to no avail. Honestly, I wasn't sure I could do this to her, even if I wanted to. Given the impending trial, I did not broach the topic of divorce. But her lawyer and prosecutor recently agreed to a deal, and she was scheduled to report to prison in two weeks to serve her sentence. It was the right time for us to finish our business. So I opened a bottle of wine, grabbed a couple glasses, and said to Shelley, Honey, we need to talk. Shelley, we need to get everything settled before you leave, so that when you get out, you can start a new life with a clean slate. I went into the office and took out an envelope with divorce documents. He placed them in front of her. In an hour, someone will come to officially hand you the papers to record, but I thought we'd do it quietly among ourselves first. This paper right here gives me the right to sell the house. I talked to the real estate agent, and after paying all the expenses, she thinks we can get between $75,000 and $100,000. The market is good right now, so she thinks the house will sell pretty quickly, so it'll probably close before you leave. If that happens, I'll put your half on it. Your bank account. If not, we'll split the money after you're released. But hopefully when you get out, you'll have a decent bank account. Your boss promised to keep you a job, and I'm still not working, so there won't be any child support either way. The whole time I was talking, Shelley didn't take her eyes off the divorce papers. Danny, please, I don't want a divorce. When I started to interrupt her, she raised her hand. Honey, please let me speak, and I promise to let you say whatever you want after this. I needed her support to make this as easy and painless as possible, so I nodded for her to continue. Honey, I was a selfish, ungrateful bitch. I was a terrible wife, a terrible person. But I learned my lesson. Danny, I tried to have it all, but all this time you were the one I didn't want to lose. Yes, I tried not to lose Tom either, but you were the one I really didn't want to lose. Danny, you are my everything. You are my best friend. I can't imagine life without you, honey. I promise I will be the best wife in the world for the rest of my life. Shelley leaned forward in her chair and finished her words by hunching forward and clasping her hands tightly, almost as if in prayer. She looked desperate and completely lost. I'm sure she knew this was her last attempt. For the first time I believed that she really loved me. She really wants me more than anyone else. She can't imagine her life without me. Shelley, when I found you and Tom all those months ago, I was hoping to hear something like this from you then. A humble and apologetic confession that you were willing to do anything to make us work together. That you wanted me more than anyone else. That you really want me. But the problem is that you didn't. In fact, you did the exact opposite. And it allowed me to see you and our relationship in a completely different light. It's like one of those pictures hidden in a puzzle. I went with the flow. With you for many years, I married you without objectively evaluating you and our relationship. I wanted you so much. I considered you such a reward that when you finally wanted to be mine, my brain hid the real you and our real relationship behind this puzzle, behind the fog. But just like the puzzle, now that I've seen the real you and our relationship, I can't unsee it. Yes, sex has been less satisfying for me all these years, but I could ignore it. Or, as you said, the surgery could. I wish I could fix this, but you chose to betray me instead of trying to talk to me and give us a chance to find a solution together. But we have other problems, Shelley. You have no intellectual curiosity. The topics you are interested in and can talk about are very limited. 
Should I wait years for you to spend a lot of time thinking and something worthwhile appears in your head? Should I wait years for you to read hundreds, if not thousands, of books and newspapers before we can actually talk about something worthwhile? Our problems, Shelley, are much more fundamental. They concern all areas of our lives. Your infidelity with Tom was an awakening for both of us, Shelley. We were and are an incompatible couple from the very beginning. I wish we had realized it sooner and in a different manner. But now that we have seen the hidden picture, Shelley, we cannot unsee her. If you truly learn from this experience, then with your next man you will be a different person and will be able to have a much more fulfilling relationship. Sometimes something is broken into too many pieces to put back together. Shelley chose to ignore half the reasons I gave for why we weren't right for each other. Danny, but I know you're the one I want. I don't want all these Toms, or any other man. I want you. My head is in the right place right now, Danny. Please, you have to give us another chance. Just one, honey, she said with a desperate plea in her voice. I'm sorry, Shelley. The problem is that now my head is in the right place. If you really learned your lesson and are not the same selfish girl and truly love me, then do what I need, dear. Let me go, let me move on. Give me the only thing I want and need from you, my freedom. At one o'clock in the morning on the day Shelley was supposed to go to prison, she knocked on my door. Apparently I wasn't the only one who couldn't sleep. I opened the door and saw Shelley practically choking with sobs, barely able to breathe. She handed me signed and dated divorce papers. As soon as I took them, she quickly left without saying a word. My instinct was to catch up with her, comfort her, and make her feel better. But she is no longer my responsibility to comfort, and I need to stop being the savior when it comes to women. For the first time, she had to learn to stand on her own two feet. Three years have passed, and it's time for my 20th high school reunion. My private practice has flourished over the past three years, and I have hired two CPAs, four associate accountants, and five support staff. I went from a low six-figure income to a mid to high six-figure income. Apparently Shelley was wrong again. I'm good at more than just numbers. I know how to attract business and manage a growing enterprise. I quickly realized that I was approaching dating all wrong. I viewed them too unemotionally, judging women based on external parameters and raising the level of meetings. My main goal was to prove my worth to myself and Shelley. Yes, initially dating women I considered low-hanging fruit helped me heal my wounds, but I soon realized that I was still reacting to what Shelley and Tom had done to me, and it wasn't fair to the women I was dating. I needed to approach this with an open heart and be fair to women. It's not their fault that I chose a bitch as my wife. They won't have to pay for Shelley's sins. I forced myself to be more open and vulnerable. It was scary to be so vulnerable with a woman again. But a little over a year later, after filing for divorce and dating a few times, I met Amy. I met my second wife, Amy Bodark, two years ago. There couldn't be a greater contrast between my two wives. Shelley was 5 ft 10 in tall, blonde, and curvy. Amy is 5 4 tall, brunette with bright blue eyes, petite, very feminine, and beautiful. If Shelley exuded vulgar, straightforward sexuality, Amy exuded a sophisticated, sophisticated sensuality. Shelley was loud, stubborn, selfish, and uneducated, while Amy was kind, gentle, generous, loving, and hospitable, with a PhD in one of my favorite subjects, history. She was a professor at the same university where I once studied. Amy and I were like two halves connecting into the whole. There was an easy and deep connection between us, love and intimacy. When I fell in love with Amy, I realized that what I had with Shelley was not true love. Not in a real sense compared to how I felt about Amy. Over the past couple of years, I have also reconnected with almost all of my friends. Because of Shelley, I had lost contact with most of them but now Amy fit right in with them and their wives. I fit in well with her circle of friends and their spouses. I could discuss politics and ideas as much as I wanted, but now I also enjoy watching sporting events with them from time to time. We had a very active social life with a large group of friends from different walks of life with whom we both enjoyed time. At our high school reunion, 
we sat talking in a small group of three couples, two of my high school friends and their wives. Amy caught my attention and nodded at something to the right behind my shoulder. As I looked in that direction, she said, That woman has been staring at us ever since we arrived. One of your high school sweethearts who never got over you. Shelley was there. She has added at least 30-40 pounds to her already curvaceous frame. Shelley didn't look good at that weight, and her clothes were too tight for her current body. No, honey, it's ex. I mean, ex-wife. We went to school together. Shelley didn't look away or try to hide the fact that she was looking at us. I smiled and nodded at her, and she smiled sadly back at me. With that, I turned back to our group, trying to get back to the conversation. About two hours into the event, I was talking with Amy and a classmate with whom I had long since lost contact when someone tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around and saw Shelly. Smile slowly disappeared from my face. Though I knew she was here from the moment I turned my back her earlier, I completely put it out of my mind. I put a smile on my face and looked at my wife. Honey, she's a cheater. Like a trained soldier, Shelly made an impressive U-turn and walked away decisively. I shouted after her, Shelly, I'm sorry. I meant to say, it's Shelly. Shelly raised her right arm above her shoulder, and then her the middle finger suddenly straightened out, making a gesture to me. I just looked at my wife's bewildered, beautiful face and shrugged. We didn't really have anything to talk about. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.